who wants to hear from God today? Well, good, because we're going to go to the Word. It's the only book that still breathes. So um, we're going to go in just a second to John chapter 11. Uh, We're going to start in verse 38 to 44. Let's quickly just pray, though. Father, we thank you that your Word is already anointed. But we ask you right now, with this book that is still breathing, would you breathe heavy upon us today? Breathe on dead things. Breathe on dry and barren things. We ask you, Lord, that as you speak today, that the life of God would be found in us and we would not leave here the same. We believe it in Jesus' name. If you believe it, shout amen. Amen. Well, we're going to read the scripture today. I'm going to give you an opportunity to either talk back to me. And if you don't want to talk back to me when I preach, that's fine. I just preach longer. So it's up to you how how hungry you are. Um, But talk back to me and let me know you're in the room. John 11, chapter 38 to 44. Let's read this together. I think they're going to put it on the screens. Here we go. Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb, and it was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he has been there for four days. If you're familiar with King James, she says, he stinketh, Um, which is why I just still read King James sometimes just for fun. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and then Jesus looked up, and he said, Father, I thank, that you, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing around, that they might believe that you have sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice and said, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. The title of my message today is one word, called. Somebody, look at somebody and say, called, called. Now, we're going to dive and we're going to go deep into this whole, whole narrative and we're going to talk about this whole story. Um, but before, I was just thinking about this. You know, you see Lazarus and his tomb and I was thinking about funerals and I was realizing that um, I kind of have a bit of a context that not everyone does. My experience is a little different when it comes to death, and that is I was raised in a pastor's home my whole life, and my parents pastored smaller churches, which just means this. It means um, you marry everybody and their brother and their mama. You bury everybody, and the, you, like, you do every funeral. You do every everything, and so um, we didn't have babysitters. We just was like the babies just sit wherever we are. That's how my parents thought. So they brought us everywhere. So I grew up going to funerals all of the time. Funerals of people that I did not know. So funerals, gravesides, everything. In fact, I remember one day looking at my mom at a gravesite and seeing her cry. And I was like, she doesn't even know them. Like, how does she do this? So I've been around a lot of funerals. I remember waking up in the middle of the night. Like, I went to sleep. I know I went to sleep in my bed. But I just woke up in a waiting room in a hospital to the voices of people crying and wailing because someone, my parents just woke us up, drug us there. And walking in and seeing the body afterwards to go say goodbye. So um, I've been exposed to a lot of death and a lot of funerals. And I'll say this, when you attend the funeral, especially of someone that you're not really intimately connected with, it's a bit of a different experience. Um, So I would sit in these funerals, and maybe it's just me. Maybe I am just the most narcissistic person in the world. Um, But I would sit in these funerals, and you would hear the eulogy, and they're trying to come up with the best stuff to say about this person. And, you know, some of the people in the crowd are like, you are reaching. You were just trying so hard to find something. He didn't do all that. But sometimes I got a lot to say, and, and they've been really impacted in your move. Like, wow, look at what they left behind. But there's this thing. I can't go to a funeral without, at some point, my mind wandering to my funeral. And I start to think, when I hear them speaking about this person, what are they going to say about me when I'm gone? What, what will they say? And then you, maybe it's just me and I'm the only narcissist in the room, but I start to think about, okay, well, death comes early sometimes, but when I die, will I have finished? Will, will, I, will I have done anything impacting? Or are they going to have to try to reach to try to find something to say? And it's something about funerals that make you really assess your life. I don't know if, if you've been there before, but the death and funerals make you look at your priorities a, li- a little different. You start to think things like this. Why am I alive still? 
What was I born for? Have I discovered the thing that I was born for? What is my purpose? It is the obsession within the church, right? What is my purpose? What is my calling? What is the why that I'm here? And this is what happens. When someone finally discovers their why, their purpose, what they've been called to do, it is like watching a dead person come to life. They don't live the same way anymore because they have finally figured out what they were born for. Lazarus was an ordinary guy, and he ends up becoming one of the fa most famous guys in church history. In fact, right now, there are people lined up across the world, lined up to take a tour of the tomb where he lay, because Lazarus is now so famous inside the church, outside the church, but there was a, a time when he was just an ordinary guy. I started looking at Lazarus, and I thought, isn't that the story that so many in this generation are chasing? Because what happened to Lazarus is he blew up. He was an ordinary guy who all of a sudden got put, and he became famous and prominent, and now he's got notoriety, and he has so much impact and influence in the world for Jesus. And, and imagine this. Imagine hundreds of years, some little petite blonde girl gets up to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, opens up the scripture, and the story she decides to tell that day is yours. Can you imagine? This is a guy who lived out his calling and purpose. Let me give you just some of the highlights of his life after this resurrection um, before we look more into it. Just some of the highlights are, if you read later on in chapter 11 uh, with me, we'll see that the disciples are with Jesus. And Jesus says to the disciples, the people he handpicked to serve him, to lead the church, to do miracle signs and wonders. They've left everything with them to go with him. These people who have so much faith and have believed in Jesus, he says, you know what? For your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there when he died so that you can believe. Do you mean to tell me the most influential men in Christian history were influenced by a regular guy who one day came alive. What about Mary? I see the picture of Mary at the feet of Jesus anointing and, 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 the, and the gospel of Mark. We find Jesus saying this is a story that will be told as long as the gospel is preached. Do you mean to tell me that that story, because that happens after Jesus raises her brother from the dead, by the way, do you mean to tell me that story likely would have never happened if Lazarus hadn't come alive, C.C. Winans would have never been able to pour her praise on him like oil from her alabaster box if Lazarus didn't come alive. And I kept looking, and I saw time after time in chapter 11 and chapter 12 when it says many were believing on Jesus because of Lazarus. Crowds were coming, and they were putting their faith in Jesus because of Lazarus. And I'm going, look at the impact. Wow, this is crazy. There's crowds now following after him. And when they see him and they go, okay, now I believe in that Jesus. This is a guy who made such an impact because he finally came alive. In fact, in John 12, 19, there was a huge crowd, the Bible says, that was there. And it says they continued to spread the word. And it says this, so the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Not after Lazarus. They're saying because of Lazarus, the whole world has gone after Jesus. I don't know about you, but if they said that about me at my funeral, that the whole world went after Jesus, I would say I did the thing I was called to do. And I wonder this today, because not only then, but even now, do you know the city where he was from, Bethany still exists, but they renamed it. We can't call it Bethany anymore. And it is now called the city of Lazarus, the place of Lazarus. That kind of impact, all this because one man came alive. And so I can't help but wonder in a room like this, what would happen if just one man or one woman finally discovered the thing that they were born for and decided to live for it until they had to die? I wonder what would happen if one person in here actually really came alive. Well, here's the thing. Everything I just mentioned about Lazarus, the crowds and the fame and the and the turning the world toward Jesus, those are, those are the highlights, right? Those are the highlights. The highlights I equate to kind of like what people post on social media about their life, right? The best angle, 
Yeah, the kids are behaving. They're not throwing things at each other or their parent in the picture. The best meal, not the one you scrapped and put in the garbage can because it didn't turn out and it burned. They put their highlights on Instagram. But how do you know? If you were to see all the in-between their highlights, you probably would be more content with your life. See, this is the highlights of Lazarus' life. But let me tell you what I do. Because I have a particular way that I study as a teacher and of the scripture. I, I, I look at the scripture. And my first thing is I always want to study in its original content. What did it mean back then? And I want to look at the geography. And I want to look at all those things. And once I have established it in its context, this is what I like to do. Um, is I like to try to bring it forward into my context and imagine it now. Because I feel like the scriptures are sometimes so ancient. We have a hard time connecting to it. So I try to bring it forward into my time. So allow me a little liberty. I'm not a heretic, and I'm not saying that this really happened. Um, what I am saying is that I, I want us to imagine for a moment Lazarus' Instagram account. Can we do that? Is this the right service? In the 9 a.m., I was like, maybe I have Facebook, MySpace. No, top six. Okay. I think I got the right card. Instagram. So, so uh, let's just uh, allow me a liberty, and let's just imagine what this life, what Lazarus' life would have looked like on his Instagram account. So I start thinking, right? So he starts off, he's just a regular guy. Maybe they've got a little money, but they're not prominent. They're not, you know, he's just a regular guy. So he's probably got, what, about like 136 followers on Instagram and um, follows about 98. And he's, he's got, you look at all his old pictures. Now we're going back to the beginning when he was just a regular guy, just Lazarus. And you're scrolling through and he got pictures of like, him and his, I don't know, his new sandals and, um, like, what he ate for dinner the night before and the fish he caught on the fishing trip. And, and it's like, you know, 33 likes, a couple comments here and there. Oh, the next post is like him playing a practical joke on Mary and Martha. And they're like, my hair is not even done. Turn that off. And it's just regular stuff, right? It's just a little bit of people responding. And then it's all these pictures, just, just regular stuff. And you scroll back, and then you keep scrolling, and you bring it more forward. And then all of a sudden, there's this, this picture. Uh, it's, it's just like one of those text ones. And it's like Martha. And she's like, hey, guys, Martha here um, on Lazarus' account. I just wanted to ask you guys all to pray for him because he just suddenly got really sick. And um, we just want some prayer. And then she tags Jesus so he can know to hurry and come home because where are you at right now? We need you to heal. So she tags at Jesus. So, hey, guys, just play for Laz. And let's just, you know, start a prayer chain, okay? So um, that's that post. And then a little while later, you see another post, and it's gone now from somber to more urgent. And it's like, hey, guys, Mary and Martha here, we want to ask you to repost this and get this to as many people. We need people praying, and we need people fasting because Lazarus has taken a turn for the worse. And it's not looking good right now, but we still believe that when at Jesus finally gets himself back here and comes, it's, you know, everything's going to be okay. So please help us pray because it's not looking good. And then, and then um, they're like, you know, he's probably just not getting cell service where he's at. I'm sure he didn't just leave me on red. I'm sure... Um, He's somewhere, and so people are replying, hey, yo, thoughts and prayers are with you, Mary and Martha, Eminem, we love you, and um, hey, just um, keep your head up. I'm sure he's going to be fine. Your boy Jesus is going to come back. Y'all been there for him. He's going to be, it's all going to be good. So they're leaving all their comments. He'll be there soon, and then another post comes. Hey, this is Mary. I never dreamed the day would come when I would have to pin this post. But I need to let you all know that the brother that we have loved, we have lost. We want to thank you for your support in this incredibly difficult time. We don't know what to do, but we appreciate your prayers and support. Here's the funeral arrangements if you want to come out. It's tomorrow because there's no embalming. So if you want to come, get your donkey and hurry up. So, um, so here's the funeral arrangements. And then... And then it goes quiet because it's over. There's no more posts for a while. It's just, it's just quiet. And, and, and I can see his sisters just walking through the house and walking through his room and seeing all his things. And like, what do we do with this? this is, they're trying to process still. Like, this is a, these are real people in the Bible. I don't know if you've realized that. These aren't characters in a movie. These are real people processing your pain. Like, okay, Jesus didn't come. He died. Okay, is this really real? He's dead. What do we do with our stuff? And then Mary kind of is like, hey, Martha, what about his social media accounts? Do we leave them up? Disable them? Like, what's the protocol? Do we just, just leave it up? So in the meantime, they kind of leave it up, right? And, and people are coming back and making their comments like, hey, man, what a shame. 
Laz was a good man, and he really thought Jesus loved him, but Jesus never showed. Somebody else is coming and, and saying, man, ladies, I, I'm so sorry you had to find out this way that that Jesus guy is a fraud. I hate that you got played. And these are the things that are coming, and Jesus isn't looking very good right now because Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were one of the few people that actually believed he was who he said he was, and now it looks like he has failed them. So it just goes quiet. And then four days later, all his 136 followers get this random notification, like Lazarus has gone live, and they're like, oh, man, something's going on. This is silly. It says Lazarus has gone live. He's been dead for days. Mary probably has her phone in her pocket again and it accidentally went live. Let's just see, curiosity. So they, so they tap on Lazarus has gone live, and they look, and they're like, what is happening? Is that like, there's just like chaos, and it's like dust flying everywhere, and people are screaming, oh, my God, and everything is just crazy. Like, what is what is happening on this live account? Where are they? And then, and then you see like uh, what looks like a, a, a cave, a tomb, and a stone that's been rolled away. And they're like, what in the whole world is going on right now? What is this live thing? And then in the middle of it, all of a sudden, it just the feed cuts, beep, and it just goes black. And so everybody's on their phone like just steady hit and refresh, refresh, refresh. What's going on? What's going on? Nothing, nothing, nothing. And then like 20 minutes later, a post comes up. It's a selfie of Lazarus with Jesus. He's like, hashtag Jesus loves Lazarus. And Jesus is like plugging his I was like, yeah, he stinketh, hashtag, never lay, always on time. And, and overnight, <laughs> overnight, his account and his whole life blows all the way up. He goes from having 136 followers to having 1.3 million followers because everyone has found out. And all of a sudden, Lazarus is the name that everybody knows. And he has been plummeted into um, being a prominent and now notoriety and fame. And if you were to those people that like to look back and see where they came from, you'd go to his Instagram account and you'd see the most current ones of him and Jesus dining out and stuff like that. And there's like 10,000 likes, but then you keep scrolling and you would see the, the regular life before. And then you would see the posts from his sisters and you would see the after, but I'd tell you what you would never see. You won't see posts from four days in a tomb. And you won't see any posts from Lazarus when he's on his deathbed. And he's struggling for breath and asking into a pillow, where are you at, Lord? Trying to understand why this Jesus who he has watched heal so many other people has left him there to die. You won't see posts of the questioning or the desperation. You won't see the tears. And the scriptures don't give us all those details. But they do let, let us know the answer to one important question which we all have when we read this narrative is this, is if Jesus loved Lazarus, where was he when he needed him? Maybe you've asked that question before. If you, if you really love me, where are you at when I need you the most? And so today as we go to the scripture, I have brought the scripture towards us, but now we need to take ourselves and go back to the scripture. And I want you to maybe even right now just look at your feet and imagine the dust of that day, because we're going to take a walk and we are going to see Jesus in the flesh and we're going to see Mary and Martha and Lazarus and we are going to walk this story out and see what God would say to us today. Let me set the scene before we read. Uh, what's happening when we step onto the scene is this, is that, you know, Mary and Martha and Lazarus have been really close to Jesus during his ministry, they're one of the few radical believers in him. They've all the way bought into him, supported him. So Jesus has been, like, in their house, eating the food out of their fridge, straight out of the fridge. He's been sleeping on their couch, all this kind of stuff. He has been very close to them. And then he's gone on a ministry trip. He's away, and he's doing ministry somewhere. And all of a sudden, Lazarus gets really sick. And so um, they're convinced he's a healer. So in, all their mind, in their mind, they think this. All we need to do is get word to Jesus. Because if he comes back, that's all that needs to happen. Boom. We've seen him do it before. He'll do it again because he loves us. And we have had his back. So they get word to Jesus. Chapter 11, verse 1 and then verse 3 says this. At this time, a man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany, the village of Mary and his, his sister Martha. So the sisters sent word to Jesus. They called Jesus. Lord, the one you love is sick. The one that you love is sick. Can you hear the tone in their voice? Like, hey, Jesus, this is personal. 
I know I've seen you heal strangers in the crowd, but don't forget, this is the one you love. We're the ones who have had your back, Jesus. Surely, if you would come for and heal anyone, it will be us. Jesus, the one that you love, is sick. He's on the road with his disciples, and they get word to him somehow. And this is what we say, uh, we see, verse 4. When Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness won't end in death. Nah, it's for the glory of God so that the Son of God might be glorified through it. We're going to come back to that verse, but let's move on. Now, Jesus loved Martha, and he loved her sister, and he loved Lazarus. The Scripture is wanting us to know one thing. There's a lot of things that you have to just assume or imagine, but you don't have to imagine this. The fact is that Jesus loved Lazarus, and this is not the, the same loved that is used in scripture when it talks about Jesus loving the whole world. This is a decided and unique love. So the Bible wants us to know that he had a special love for Lazarus and this family. And then it says this, he loved them so on hearing that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two days. Okay, let me get this right. He loved Lazarus. Then we see the word so, which the actual trans translation here is the word therefore. And it is a very powerful word. Therefore is a conjunction that joins two thoughts. Sorry, I'm an English junkie, but I love this. Okay, it joins. It says whatever is about to see, be said after this, therefore, is tied to what was said before the therefore. Right? So it means this. Jesus loved Lazarus. Therefore, because he loved him, he stayed where he was two more days. What are you doing, Jesus? Where are you at when he needs you? John eleven seven says this, and he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. So now it's been two days. He stayed two days. And now he decides, okay, now we will, we will go back. He still hasn't sent word to Mary and Martha. And they don't know why they've been left on red, why he hasn't responded to them. They just know he hasn't come. So two days go by. John 11, verse 11 and 2, 15. After he had said this, he told them, he says to the disciples, because they are not wanting to go back. They're scared because... Um, the way they're going back, they're pretty sure that Jesus and all of them are going to get killed. And so they try to talk Jesus out of it. He's got his mind made up. He's going. So this is, he says this to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. Again, Jesus reminding us that this is his friend that he loves. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. And his disciples replied, like I would have, uh, Lord, but if he sleep, he'll get better. They thought that Jesus was talking about actual sleep. But he was speaking about the death of Lazarus. So Jesus told them plainly, you know, Lazarus is dead, okay? And for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there so that you might believe. Let us go to him. So after waiting a couple days, he heads back to Bethany. And now he's back in town, and they do make it there alive. Verse 17, and when Jesus arrived, he found, he found that Lazarus had already spent four days in the tomb. You need to know that in these times, after three days, decomposition starts to happen about the body. There was a lot of Jewish um, thoughts back then that, that people, that a spirit hovered for three days over a body, which is partly why we believe that Jesus may have decided to wait four days because it could happen sometimes back then that before three days had happened, they would be carrying someone in their casket to their tomb and they would suddenly resuscitate. But what really happened was that person, they just didn't have a detectable heartbeat. They were never really dead to begin with. But after three days, a body starts to decompose. So if you wait four days, only God could do that. There's no mistake. So four days he's been in the tomb. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed home. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But even I know now that God will give you whatever you ask. And he says, your brother will rise again. And Martha goes, I know he's going to rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, girl, I am the resurrection. Oh, if you underline stuff in your Bible or in your highlighted and you think, I want you to under underline I am. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she answered. I believe that you are. Why don't you underline you are too? I am and you are. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who has come into the world. Now, first of all, this is one of the most profound statements of faith 
in all of scripture. She's saying, I don't believe you're just a healer, a teacher, or sent by God. I believe you are the son of God. Even though my, my brother is dead, I believed it then, and I still believe that you are the son of God. This is a statement of faith, even when she says, if you would have been here. It is still a statement of faith. She is saying, nowadays you're not omnipresent because you're not in heaven, you're here. So we still believe that you're a healer. We believe the problem isn't with who you are. It was just with where you were. You weren't here. We still believe. We still have faith you're a healer, but you just, you were at the wrong place, Jesus. Where were you? Jesus says, I am. And what I believe about this is that she didn't necessarily have the faith in this moment to believe that a resurrection was ha going to happen. That, that wasn't really necessarily on her mind. And Jesus was saying, I'm not asking you, do you believe for a specific um, miracle? I'm asking you do this. Do you believe in who I am, that I am? Do you still believe in the character of God? Do you still believe in the sovereignty of God? Do you still believe? And then she is saying, I believe in who you are. You are the son of God. And I don't know what you can do with this situation, but I still have faith to believe that you are the son of God. But the problem is you weren't here. It's not with who you are. It's with where you were. Now, she says this, you, you would have not have died. Next verse, verse 28 through 32, Martha reiterates the same thing. After Martha had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside to tell her, the teacher's here and he's asking for you. And when Mary heard this, she got up quickly and ran to Jesus. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who, who were in the house consoling Mary saw how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn. When Mary came to Jesus and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Mary and Martha both making a statement saying, God, we had faith that you would heal him. And I need someone in here to understand this, that Lazarus died in an atmosphere of faith, surrounded by people who absolutely believed that Jesus was a healer, but he still died. Why does that matter? This matters because bad theology tells you that if you die or if it doesn't turn out the way you prayed for, that that means you didn't have enough faith. But that is not gospel theology because the problem with that theology is it says that the power to heal or change a situation rests in your faith. And there are two problems with that, your and faith. It means that you have put your faith in yourself or you put your faith in faith rather than putting your faith in a sovereign God whose ways are beyond your ways and whose thoughts are beyond your thoughts. Real faith, good theology about faith. It says, I don't care how bad it looks. I'm going to believe God till my last breath that he can and then he will. But if he doesn't, I'm going to believe that because he hasn't given me the thing I prayed for, anything that dies in an atmosphere of faith will resurrect, which means God hasn't given me what I prayed for. He plans to give me something better than I prayed for. See, faith is believing that the answer God has given you is greater than the answer that you wanted him to give you. Faith, real faith, is believing that the answer God has given you is just better than the answer that you wanted him to give you. So here she is at his feet, weeping, but making statements of faith. And she's frustrated because here's another idea about good theology is faith can be frustrating. I don't know who told you it can't, but faith can be frustrating because it can be frustrating to know with every fiber of your being down into your bone marrow that Jesus can do something and then watch him decide not to do something. Faith can be frustrating. It doesn't mean that I don't believe. It means I'm frustrated because Jesus, you can bring yourself off that cross. So why aren't you coming down off that cross? And it can be frustrating, but they still had faith. Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they answered. And Jesus wept. I know you've heard that verse, but have you ever stopped to imagine a picture of Jesus weeping? I mean, overcome with emotion that he could not control. Jesus wept, and then the Jews said, 
see how he loved him? Some of them asked, could not this man who opened up the eyes of the blind also have kept Lazarus from dying? It's interesting here as we see uh, in the original language, Jesus deeply troubled and moved in spirit, and it means a lot of different things. He's, he's not just sad. Um, some of these words actually indicate anger, and there's a lot of strong emotions that Jesus is overcome with. And I won't assume um, things not in Scripture, um, so I'm not going to assume why he was feeling all of these different kinds of emotions and who they were directed at. All I know is this. I don't know why Jesus felt all this emotion, but I know that he did. I know this, that Jesus loved this family. Why are you weeping when you know how the story ends? That's what I want to know is, is why are you weeping when you know what you're about to do? And this is, this is what I believe. I believe that there are some things in our lives that Jesus watches happen and he has to even let happen but that doesn't mean that he enjoys them or that he is ignoring you. In fact, as many times there's things that God is watching happen in your life and you can't hear him, but what he's actually doing is weeping because you know what? Just like you, he hates the systems of this world. He hated death. He hated sin. None of those things originate from heaven. They all come from the fall. So Jesus is frustrated, whether it's at, uh, at um, his death or at the people there mourning, it doesn't matter. Jesus is moved and I want someone in here to know that Jesus was overcome because it's not that he doesn't care what you're going through. The problem is this, that Jesus remembers what it feels like. He remembers what it feels like to be betrayed, and he hates it. He remembers what it feels like to be ignored or exposed. He remembers what it feels like to be wronged or misunderstood or overlooked or broken. And when you walk through suffering, he knows what it feels like. And so he is not just sitting idly by. He is there, and oftentimes he hates what you're going through, and he is weeping with you. But I believe there's things he allows to happen because, like Lazarus, he remembers this in his own life. He remembers, Jesus remembers what his death cost, but he also remembers what it bought. And Jesus knows that you are praying prayers in your life that aren't big enough. That you are asking him to do something and you don't even know how to pray. So he will grieve with you and he will hurt with you. And yet he will still allow you to bury some things that he could heal because he knows that it needs to die in order to resurrect. Because he knows that he intends to do something bigger than you're asking for. See, the God who wept then cares about your pain. It's just this. He's more committed to your future than to your feelings. He's more committed to the future you can't see than he is to your feelings. So he weeps with you, but he'll let you bury it. Because until it dies, he can't call it back. See, Lazarus shaped history. He blew all the way up. Famous, everything else. He's still famous back in the city. He's named after now. But he was just a regular guy. And the only reason any of these things ever happened is because he answered the call. Because he committed, he, he fulfilled the thing he was sent to this earth to do. He did what he was born for. But before you exci get excited, let me tell you this. He was born to die. He was born to die. He was foreordained. See, we talk a lot about the resurrection, and we get really excited, but we forget that resurrections can't happen without a death. And when it happened, death seemed like the very worst thing could happen to him. And sometimes stuff happens that feels like rock bottom to you, and you have no idea that it's actually a springboard that God wants to use to elevate you, to elevate your faith and elevate your life, and to bring you to a place that you don't even know how to ask him to bring you to. It was the heart of, hardest time of his life being left to die, but he was born for this. This is what he was called to do. God so loved the world that he sent Jesus to die. God so loved Lazarus that he sent Lazarus to this world to die. God so loved the world that he sent us to this world to die. And we're so busy trying to figure out how to resurrect. And God is get, trying to just get us to die because resurrection power only happens from his hands. See, everybody wants a miraculous, famous life, but you don't know that it, it costs you four days in a tomb. 
And that's why you can scroll all you want, but don't covet a man's crown before you've seen his cross. See, what do you, you don't know what they had to watch die in order to see. You're just seeing their resurrection. You have no idea what they had to bury to see this happen. What do you mean I have to die? You know what? I'm not sure what that means for you. I, I think it could be different things for different people. Somebody in here needs to die to sin. Somebody needs to die to the flesh. Somebody needs to die to ambition or to the selfish dream, American dream that you have. Somebody needs to die to pride and laziness in your marriage or on your job. Somebody needs to, to die to that thing that you want more than you want Jesus I don't know but I'll tell you this it's probably the thing the Holy Spirit is highlighting in your heart right now that's probably the thing in your life that needs to die and this message is urgent because what I see is this I see a generation of people who are running after resurrection running after famous I want to be like Lazarus I want to be famous and they're running after resurrection while running away from death and running towards resurrection but away from death is literally just running in a circle and I want to tell you it is exhausting and you will never catch resurrection while running away from death it will be like running in circles like chasing after the wind and all you will do is exhaust yourself to death exhaust yourself to depression exhaust yourself into following away exhaust yourself into every but a resurrection you saw Jesus raise some people up but you, but you don't know what they watched die see there's a part I, back, I bypassed earlier verse 4 Jesus told them this sickness won't end in death Jesus with his disciples and he goes it sounds to me just with a natural ear like he's saying Mary and Martha are tripping he's sick but he's not gonna die that's what it sounds like to me it's not going to end in death. It sounds like he's not taking it, it seriously. But imagine being the people who heard Jesus say that, and you're thinking, he's just sick, he's not going to die, and then he dies. And what it looks like is Jesus promised a thing and failed to fulfill it. It, it looks like what you see isn't lining up with what he said, because Lazarus did die. But, but if you really look close, you realize he didn't say Lazarus wouldn't die he said death wouldn't be the end. He said it wouldn't be over. And sometimes what we do is as soon as we have a moment where it seems like God hasn't kept his promise, anytime we see a, a time or a season when it feels like God has not kept his word, what we do is we bury that thing, we grieve it, we give up, and we walk away because we see a failure as final. Or we see a moment or an interruption or a delay as final. Or we see a season in our life as final because what is more final than a burial and a stone going over a tomb? We see it as final. And so we walk away and we mourn it. And I want to tell you this, that's the wrong thing to do because grieving and mourning is for the end. You don't mourn the middle. And maybe there are some things or some dreams in your life that you have grieved and you have mourned. And I'm telling you, you don't know this, but that is not the end. It's just the middle. And God says, do not mourn the middle. He was in the tomb, but he was in the middle. The tomb feels like the most final ending point you could have in life he was in the tomb but he was in the middle maybe someone in here knows what it's like to be in the middle in the middle is a place where it is too dark to see anything past the moment in the middle is where it doesn't seem like there's a way out or a next it, in the middle it's dark in the middle it's isolated in the middle, in the middle, in the tomb, all you can hear is the echo of your own voice. You have nothing else, no other words. It's isolated in the middle. It's cold in the middle. It's lonely in the middle. In the tomb, the people that you thought loved you easily move on from you, forget about you big time. You sidestep you in the middle. People walk away, and you don't know why they've walked away. In the middle, he was in a tomb, but he was in the middle. And in the middle is when the enemy will start saying stuff to you like, see God is done with you in the in the middle is when God will say look he used you the enemy will say look he used you up he got what he wants for, for your life and then he didn't show up when you needed him you were there for Jesus and he wasn't there for you in the middle is where the enemy taunts you and says stuff to you like God has failed you. God has forgotten you. God has forsaken you. You'll never get past this. You'll never recover from this. It is dark in the middle, in the middle, 
in the tomb. It is too dark for self-promotion. And you can try as hard as you want to position yourself or to make yourself visible or to blow yourself up. But I want to tell you, it's too dark for self-promotion. In the middle, in the middle is a darkness that no filter can break through. You can't post anything from the middle. It won't turn out because this is a picture that has to be developed and it can only be developed in the dark, in the middle. There's a darkness you can't see past and you finally just have to get tired enough to give up on ambition because it's too exhausting throwing yourself against a stone that one man can never, ever roll. And you finally decide, you know what? Forget it. I'll die to this. See, someone's in the middle today and you need to know this. It's not that God doesn't love you. It's just that before he can raise you up, he's got to let you die. And when you've imagined him, you've imagined him as being uncaring. And today you need to have a picture for the rest of your life of every time you feel pain. You need, you need to say that, see the Jesus that wept and watches you and is moved by your suffering but has decided that he will be more committed to your future than your feelings. Sometimes before God raises you up, he got to let you die. And that means before he can reveal your call, he has to ignore your call. Left on red. Where are you, Jesus? I had to ignore your call so that you would respond to mine. See, God's, the Lazarus name, he was called Lazarus by his mother. But Lazarus means God has helped, past tense. God had called Lazarus before anything because you know what? He knew one day I'm going to raise this guy up. There's going to be a city named after him, but I'm not doing it so they can name a city after him and elevate his name because within his name is my name. God has helped Lazarus. See, this is, you go, why do I got to die? And this is what I love. When he was dead. See, God wanted to do something with Lazarus so big. Lazarus didn't know how to ask for it, dream about it, nothing. His faith was here, healing. He didn't know to, to believe for a resurrection. And, and he wouldn't have understood it. And probably he wouldn't have even said yes to God if God had asked him to do everything he was about to ask him to do. But here's why he had to die. When he was dead, God could have a conversation with his spirit without being interrupted by his flesh, by his mind, his will, or his emotions. When he was dead, when Lazarus was dead, Jesus could bypass all of that and ask Lazarus to do the craziest thing imaginable. And he wouldn't have to coach him or convince him because Lazarus was dead. And Lazarus couldn't rationalize and try to figure out his own plan because he was dead and because he was dead he couldn't try to tell Jesus how to do it like I know you want to do this but I don't really want to come upstairs and have all these people see me doesn't have to be four days do I have to stink do I have to decompose a bit do I have to look a mess how about if we do it my way Jesus but he was dead so he didn't have to figure out he had no way all he could do is just respond Jesus didn't have to convince him that his future would be worth more than it cost because he was dead. So all Jesus had to do was call his name. And he came out unprepared but called. Disoriented but called. Weak and frail but called. Confused but called. Scared but called. No negotiation, no contract, no special request but called. I want to tell you sometimes the moment is just too urgent and God doesn't have time to mess with your flesh. He needs a now yes. So sometimes he has to let you die so that you will say yes to the life that you were born for. Maybe he's ignored your call so you'd respond to his. And so I just want to tell you this today. Hurry up and die. Hurry up and die. You're not getting out of that tomb. You're not getting a resurrection without your time in the tomb. And while you're obsessing in your life about finding your purpose, you need to notice this. Lazarus didn't find his purpose. His purpose found him. He wasn't chasing a resurrection. He was chasing Jesus. You think this happened overnight, like, oh, he resurrected, but this resurrection is a long process. The long process when a man 
walked closely in friendship with Jesus. You want to sleep on my couch, okay. You want to eat my food, okay. You want me to risk everything by housing you when people hate you, okay. It was when somewhere along the way, walking in friendship with Jesus, Lazarus proved to Jesus that he could be trusted with the resurrection, that he could entrust him with something so great. And Lazarus would never try to make it about himself or say he got his own way out there. He needed to know. And somewhere along the way, Lazarus had already proven that he could be trusted with the resurrection. He didn't even know he was taking a test, and he passed it. And I was studying. I wanted to see what kind of grave this was because I, I see the passage we, we start, started with where he says, roll the stone, and he calls him out, and Lazarus comes forth. And I imagine this really climatic, dramatic moment where they push the stone away like Jesus, and he, like, steps across it like it's the finish line, like Lazarus is there. It's what I see in my mind, and I was a little bit surprised. The first picture I saw was of the outside of what is known to be Lazarus' grave. If you can put that one up with the stone that's been already moved. Um, do they have that one? So the picture I saw first was a picture of them outside the grave. And this wasn't actually them, but that is what they believed to be his grave. Um, and there was a stone rolled out of that. So I'm thinking, I just imagined him like, ta-da, coming out. But when I saw the stone, I thought this, the stone is a door that he needs to be opened to walk into a resurrection. And I felt the Holy Spirit saying this to me, when it's time for your resurrection, you won't have to create your own entrance and you won't have to push down any doors because when it's time, Jesus will do what he did then and he asked some people to move the stone and there was people God used to open the door and the doors that one man, Lazarus, could never open, God used other people to open those doors to his resurrection. When, when he's ready to call you out, you don't have to open that door. And you will exhaust yourself throwing against it. And this is the other thing I saw. So I imagine him coming out when they, these guys move it. But then I realized this. I saw the next picture, that he actually was buried in the kind of a grave. If you show the next one, that doesn't go out, it goes down into the ground. I believe there was at least 20 steps that Lazarus had to climb up. When Jesus called him, this is not as dramatic a moment as I thought. There's a crowd. Jesus yells with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. You hear some noises maybe. And, and what's happening is a man has heard God call his name. And he's stumbling up the stairs. And scripture says he was still in grave clothes because once he gets to the top, they tell him, they tell them unwrap and, and take off his clothes. And as soon as I saw this, I was like, man. This happened a lot slowly, more slowly than I thought it happened. And here's what else I thought. I immediately heard the words of Jesus in the following chapter when Jesus is talking about his own death. And he describes it like this. He says, unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it dies alone. But if it falls into the ground and dies, then it comes back up and has much fruit. And I realized this, Lazarus' life was a seed. And it looked like a final ending, but he wasn't really being buried. He was being planted. And when you start to see your life the way God sees it, you don't see final things as final. Because if you see your life as a seed, you don't see a burial as being a place to grieve. A burial of a seed is a place of expectation where you put that thing in the ground. You throw the dirt over and you stand there and you water and you watch and you wait. You say, I don't know what's coming up. I don't know how it's coming up or when it is. But I know this, when it comes back up, it's coming up better than it was when I put it in the ground. I'm getting more than what I put in the ground because my death, my life is a seed. And so death is not a burial. I'm being planted. And I see this. <laughs> I talked at the beginning about not wanting, people not wanting to climb a ladder of success. Right? I want to tell you this. That ladder of success, you climb it, you only get to the top and find it's leaning against the wrong wall. That's ambition. And if you want to be elevated to the place that God has for you, don't take the ladder. Take the stairs. He wasn't a man that was ambitious, seeking after a famous resurrection moment. He was a guy like this that died in faith, that suffered a while. And then he had no idea what was outside, but then he heard the voice of his friend. What is it like to be called? It's not to imagine the great things that you could do for Christ. It is to respond to the voice of your friend. And one step at a time, say, I don't know what you're asking me to do, but I'm coming up closer. 
until I got close enough to the voice to get my assignment. Lazarus was called. He loved him. He let him die so he could call him out. And today, I want to tell you the same for you. Jesus loved Lazarus. Jesus loves you. <laughs> and the enemy may have lied to you, and you might be in the middle, but today you need to know it might not be time for your resurrection. I'm not going to preach. It's everybody's time to come out, come out, come out, come out, come out. You get everybody excited because it might not be your time. It might be your time to die. Somebody needs to just get in the grave. Or somebody's already in the grave, and they need to know this isn't final. It's just the middle. And you need to stop exhausting yourself trying to mind, open up your own door and make something of yourself. And somebody needs to know that Jesus will open the door at the right time. And some people just need to know that Jesus had a plan for this before, before you were born. Lazarus means God has helped. And that means this. Whatever is going to happen with your life, as long as you die, it's already done. It's already done. So your life is a seed. And you have an option whether you will bring it back to Jesus and return it to him as a seed or as the harvest that he is desiring. I want to encourage you today, drop it into the ground.